Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It's Thursday, August 4th. Derek Van Riper here with Eno Saris. We are now two days removed from the trade deadline. And what a trade deadline it was. We, of course, had our live stream on the Athletic Baseball Show. It's the 3 Show episode for this week, which I think until Britt comes back should just be the 2 Show. If we have a guest, <laughs> we can call it the 3 Show. If it's just the two but of will us, it be the no 4-0 show. show when she comes back? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's the question. How, how active will our, our new uh, fourth host on the show uh, be uh, in in the first uh, few months? Uh, that's a good question and a great <laughs> unknown, really, for us as we continue potting. Uh, we'll talk about the busy trade deadline, some observations now that things have sunk in. Seems like an appropriate time to have a prospect of the week segment as well, so we will dig into that. we got a few mailbag questions to get to, some trading-related stuff as well. Um, now that we've had time to absorb it, the Soto trade, as it has come to be known, and San Diego's all-in push at this deadline, it's just fun because teams don't ordinarily go this hard all at once and I think it is refreshing because the contrast of what the Brewers did who they were a part of the teams that made deals with the Padres trying to get it right long term and thread the needle trying to be perfect let's get let's try to get a little better right now and and have more long-term value here I think that's a really really fine line to walk and it's also there's a few there's a few downsides to this. Like it's so much easier to be the aggressive buyer because your team gets excited, your fan base gets excited. Everyone loves you, right? If you're AJ Preller, you can do no wrong in this moment. When you try to thread the needle, the way that David Stearns is no trying to No one loves you. Everyone turns against you. The people that are asked about players. the players. You know, the players are sad. You're a first place team and you made your team sad even if you didn't make your team worse. In the eyes of your team, you didn't get better. And that, I mean, hurts them. That sends a message. The the poetic justice last night of the first inning for the Padres walk from Juan Soto, walk from Josh Bell, grand slam from Brandon Drury, and then the ninth inning for the Brewers. I mean, it's coincidence, probably. <laughs> yes, it is. It is, <laughs> it is coincidence, but uh, it really sort of underlined. Uh, I think the boost that you can get uh, from from the fans uh, were were lined up or outside the stadium in San Diego. So I know that the numbers say that a single acquisition doesn't drive attendance. At the same time, uh, I, the, the intuitive underlying knowledge there that like caring matters and uh, trying to improve the team seems to give everybody an uplift. I don't know. I, I think. I think there's something there that we might just be missing when we analyze strict attendance numbers. I think the excitement level in San Diego is higher than it's ever been. And part of that is, you know, this big trade they made. The other thing that I think is really interesting about San Diego is that there we, we are just on the radio there. And, uh, you know, I said that uh, there's no uh, homegrown uh, players on this roster in San Diego. There are. We figured out who they were. Can you guess who the two homegrown San Diego Padres are that were drafted or acquired by San Diego? Drafted or acquired as prospects? Like, no, not acquired as prospects. Signed. Signed. Okay. Um, drafted or signed by the Padres. There's only two of them. That was a trade. I was just kind of quickly scanning the depth chart in my head. <laughs> yeah. They're probably relievers. Is it oh, two relievers? Oh, that's good. That's smart. It's yes, got, it's it, two relievers. Adrian Morihone's still there, right? Yes, that's one. They signed him as an international free agent. Um, and then the other one would be is it Reese Nair? Oh, <laughs> that's pretty one? good. I don't know if we I don't know if we looked at at him, but it uh Steven Wilson. Steven Wilson. Okay. But yeah, it, it, there you it, go, two guys. <laughs> yeah, we develop players. What are you talking about? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think there there are a lot of ways to build a team. And no, this is fine. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Actually, in fact, I think it lines up really strongly with AJ Preller's best strength, right? His best strength is scouting and acquisition, you know, finding young players, you know, and uh, and if he can continue to replenish it, like remember how he first came in and he traded away all the prospects for Kimbrell and Upton and, Kemp, you know, he, yeah. he, he in Kemp and he built that team. And we all said, oh, what an awful idea. It turned out to be an awful idea, but not that long later, he had a whole bunch of new prospects. 
Right. You know, so that's a preview uh, for my prospect of the week. So here's the um, here's the big question, right? You think about stuff like Taylor Rogers ultimately replacing Hater in the bullpen, even though it was Devin Williams who gave up the game winning home run on Wednesday night. Is it is the gap between Hater and Rogers small enough over two months plus the playoffs? to say it's so unlikely to make a meaningful difference that it's worth taking on a couple of prospects. This, this is, it's worth, it's worth taking on that risk to get young talent in the organization. Is David Stern right? Or is he doing more damage than he is actual good? Because the point of playing the game in the first place, as Herm Edwards famously said, in his press you conference play. years ago, you play to win. You play to win the game. Win that's the that's game. different sport, but it's same con. Like right? when when you're as good as the Brewers are, when you're a first place team, the foot should be on the gas. The teams that played the middle were bubble wild card teams and teams that didn't expect to even be close to playoff contention. That makes yeah. sense to me. But you can't play the middle when you're a front runner in your division. I literally got a text message from an analyst uh, in the front office saying they liked that trade. And of course, they liked it because they thought it was a marginal uh, downgrade, if if you know, if not much of a, a downgrade from Hater to Rogers, and they loved getting the new prospects. However, I would have to say the type of prospects you get in a reliever trade like this, even though it's Hater, it's one of the best relievers, it's not actually like gonna really move the needle for me. Like for example. Seattle last year did the same thing where they were threading the needle, right? And, you know, uh, the, the the Seattle was wrong and right and wrong again about this trade. Remember, it was beautiful. It, would they trade away Kendall Graveman for Abraham Toro and then also traded for Diego Castillo? So they they were improving themselves for the future. You know, I'm sure. Oh, who did... Who did the Brewers also trade for? It's like Trevor Rosenthal. It's very similar. They added Rosenthal. They got Matt Bush. And then some, hey, your pitching model loves Matt Bush, by the way. But oh, yeah. They, and they, so, they quietly made the bullpen deeper. And right. it, it's it's only a little worse at its apex. At, at It's absolutely like the A bullpen is just slightly worse. But the bullpen they use most often is probably better and deeper. And I think it's, it's hard. I, I stare at baseball for a living. And it's yeah. hard for me to explain that to friends, family, fans, and people that were saying, "Hey, why did they do this?" Well, it may and- not also be it may not also be right. So here's my here's my longer point. So hey, the idea is free Abraham Toro, free Esther Ruiz, yay! Abraham Toro has shown us that why he was free, right? And to me, Esther Ruiz is going to do the same thing. Yeah, the yeah, guy does just, not hit some the ball hard. He does not hit the ball hard. And also, he was being played in the corner outfield in in the minors. Do you know the number of left fielders that have like 100 ISO? They don't exist for very long. Well, Andrew Benintendi and Stephen Kwan are like, if if Esther Ruiz, I don't, he does not going to show that kind of strikeout rate, right? Like, he, that's like, there's like a 5% chance that Esther Ruiz turns into Andrew Benintendi. Like, I, I really don't think that's that's going to happen. Guess who's third on the list that Esther Ruiz could be? Tony MF and Kemp. Yeah. So free Tony Kemp. You know, like Tony Kemp is free. <laughs> well, and, and the other argument here, <laughs> the so Robert Gosser might be a nice pitching prospect, but you're telling me if you just stayed put with Hater now, you couldn't get a prospect like Robert Gosser as part of a trade. At, in the off season, like if, if the issue is, well, we we don't want to pay Hater in his last arbitration year because Mark Atanasio wants us to keep our payroll at 130 million, and mm-hmm. if, if you have 130 million dollar payroll, yes, that's no bad use. Anyway. Fine, okay, that the, the owner imposed limits keep you from from retaining him. Make the trade well, later. It's part. It, it's the timing. I maybe think it's you don't. the timing that people are. It, it is the timing that you don't like, and and maybe maybe that's what makes sense here actually, because maybe you don't get as good of a trade in the off season because you ha- you don't have as desperate of teams. You know, in the off season they can go sign a free agent to be their closer. Yep. You know, 
And then all of a sudden it's 16 million on the open market for a pretty good closer or 16 million for Josh Hader plus a prospect, you know? So I, I, I think, um, I think maybe that's the timing is the, is the, is the concern there. And, you know, they did get two free prospects and, and maybe Ruiz will, will prove me wrong. I think it's fascinating. I don't, I don't want to be wishy-washy and be like, eh, like I, I, I kind of prefer the Prella approach a little bit. I kind of prefer, uh, I want to say I prefer the DePoto approach, but he did the same thing. Right. But, you know, I think it's a little different to go and get Diego Castillo than to get Matt Bush. I think it's a little different. Mm, Diego of, Castillo is under contract for another couple of years. Red Bush isn't. So, yeah, this doesn't help you in the long run in that particular area. But you helped yourself in another area. I don't know. Maybe the Brewers believe Asturias Ruiz can play center field. Maybe that's part of this, and, and yeah. I'm not on that. I mean, they've they've. I mean, he does. He's other still players playing defense. center field. Yeah, yeah. So we'll see. But they have outfielders at AAA. Sal Freelick is there. Garrett Mitchell's there. It just it didn't. Some strike people think the... Jackson Churio is the best prospect in baseball now. Right. Also an outfielder. So I just I I didn't quite understand it. I, I don't always understand the moves when they're made. I mean, if you look back at the last trade they made with the Padres, it looked like a big W for the Padres. Then it looked even. Then it started to look like a win for the Brewers. And now it's kind of trickling a little back closer to even again. But long term, that might end up looking just fine for Milwaukee. So <laughs> they, I don't know. The Brewers make fascinating trades, right? And to Nelson Lamette got DFA'd right. too. Well, I think that might have been matching salaries. Uh, right. I think they were, I think part of it was actually uh, buying a prospect. Like, you know, they got. Uh, they got Ruiz because they took on Lamette's money in order to make uh, the hater thing work for the salary cap in San Diego. Right. To get more than free Robert Gosser in the bullpen downgrade, they had to take back Lamette. But I thought, I reasonably thought that, that they he could might, make they might actually give a chance. And, and put it, why not put him in, like, aren't there enough bad relievers in Milwaukee that they could just put him in the bad reliever pile until he, he, he pitches his way out of it? I thought so, but the other the other plot twist is that apparently he just recently reached the service time point where he couldn't be optioned to AAA, even though he had options left without uh, agreeing to it. So they either missed that or miscalculated it, or that, that was something else that I saw thrown out there. And so I don't know if they made well, that trade thinking they could send him down for a little while, but we'll I wonder see. if there's certain things you can ask and certain things you can't ask a player. Like maybe the, maybe they just weren't able to, maybe because of timing, they were, weren't able to reach out to Nelson Lamette and ask him if he would accept the, uh, you know, a demotion uh, because there's the whole thing in Toronto where they traded for Whit Merrifield, who isn't vaccinated. And then somebody asked them and they were like, well, we didn't ask him. But it's really strange. Pretty I, obvious yeah. that we want him to get vaccinated. <laughs> right. I just think of like all the players you could trade for if you had any doubt about a, a willingness <laughs> to do that, given where you play and given the requirements to, to be eligible to play, you'd think you would know before doing that. But hey, you know, I'm I'm here and they're over there making those decisions. <laughs> so I'm very surprised that they didn't have some kind of I think they probably read that. between the lines of his last statement, like where there was yeah, sort of yeah, like, he'll take a care contender, of dot, dot, dot. You know? <laughs> and they're like, well, we're a contender. I, I got to ask you this. I put it on Twitter on Wednesday and got a few responses that I thought were pretty interesting. But do you think the tension between playing for now in baseball and playing for later would just be eased if we had shorter paths to free agency, both just in terms of number of years before you have to go on the 40 man and, of course, number of years before you reach free agency? Because I just think the the bankable years of an undervalued player, we've talked about how that's led to even fans and, and readers and everyone kind of fetishizing young players coming back in a trade. I think you'd also just push everyone in the general direction of caring more about today if you didn't have these long future windows to dream on when you acquire a player that's never even played in the big leagues before, someone that's really, really low in terms of service time. No, I think it would push more teams to play for the now. Um, if that was the case, but I think it's something that the union wants every year and something the owners are not willing to give. So, yeah, seems like a non starter, but I am increasingly just frustrated by this, this idea even, that we can play both, even uh, you know, one less year of the minimum, 
would do that. You know, right, attacking right. that Just structure go to arbitration in any way. faster. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Attacking would, that structure in any way would 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 lead to to better outcomes. I I, I also wonder about the incentives of um TV money, sort of guaranteed TV money coming in versus uh what you get from from attendance. If you could mm -hmm. if you could if you could change that somehow, if you could make it more important to have attendance, like if you could, I don't know, it, it, it's not like you're going to take TV money away. Everybody wants that guaranteed money. But there is a certain like level that teams get to. Where they're like, OK, we want to spend exactly what we're what we're promised. And then the attendance will be the icing on top, you know, and that leads to. Uh, a lot of like, this is all we can spend. And that's, that's the last part. I'm not trying to make this all about the brewers. They're just doing this thing that I think people can get really frustrated by right now. If they had done everything they did and then made a move to get one more bat or, or just something, some, some other impact kind of player. And it pushed the payroll. Up. A lot of people thought it was a precursor to something. i certainly did. I got fooled, but if they'd done that, I think the reaction would be a lot different. And we talk about it all the time. The the caps that GMs work with, front offices work with, are set by ownership. That's just those are self-imposed. Like that's just what they are. But they didn't spend a hater 16 million next year. Right. They didn't get you a know, player that's going to make that. They didn't go out and make the move for a Luis Castillo. Not that they needed pitching, but the player that would be there in 2023 that would also make them better and cover that. They mm -hmm. did it with a you know cheap league minimum player and uh, Reynolds or Loriano would be somebody who'd be a little bit more expensive next year that would play now, you know, it Mike sends a different message those outfield prospects. Yeah. Cause then if you, if you were, if you're rooting for that team or you're in that clubhouse, you're saying, well, we, you know, we're going to miss Josh, but we, we got more relievers, which is great. You know, we're all confident in our ability and we've got an upgrade to our offense. We feel great about where things are at right now. Instead it was kind of like, yeah, I don't get it. I can even kind of detect it a little bit. I think it was Craig Council. Yes, yeah, Craig Council before the game was talking to the media, and he just had Council's not like a, a super high or super low guy most of the time. He's very even keeled as a manager. You could just kind of feel it in his voice too, where it was just like, "Yeah, we got some get some good guys back there," and I don't know. Like I, I just I listened to him. Like this is a guy that is probably not happy about this decision even if he fully understands why it was made right like that's mm -hmm. that's just the way you have to live i guess in a situation like that too because milwaukee has not been good listen i think their play their pitcher player development is great i think on the hitting side you know aren't most of their hitters traded for off the top of your head how many brewers starters tyrone taylor tyrone taylor yep that's all I can come up with. Uh, they didn't develop Narvaez. They didn't develop Rowdy. They they signed Colton Wong as a free agent. They traded for Willie Adames. Yeah. Luis Urias was a trade. Omar Yelich Narvaez was a trade. Was a trade. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hunter Renfro was a trade. So, so they so they got, you know, hitting pro. They got some hitting prospects. We who like, you know, they haven't been amazing at turning those into players. Are they just gonna? Turn around and trade him again? I don't know. Uh, Who's more angry today? Um, per, you got to scale numbers down. There's more Mets fans out there. <laughs> Mets fans or Brewers fans? Who's more disappointed? Per, by more the disappointed deadline? per capita. <laughs> yeah, more disappointment <laughs> per capita. Brewers fans or Mets fans? Uh, I don't know. I'm 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 on Twitter too much, so I would, <laughs> I would say probably Mets fans or Yankees fans. Oh, good lord. Yankees fans were not happy. Well, Yankees fans can be a little over the top. But they with their threaded the needle too, right? I mean, they did go get Monta. So, like, that's 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 unfair to say that. But at the same time, trading Jordan Montgomery for Harrison Bader does have money implications. And I think it has something to do with next year's payroll. That was the thing that they did last minute. We talked about it in the stream. It was like why you don't you don't have enough pitching depth to do that you just went out and acquired an impact starter for good reason all they have is clark schmidt now i mean maybe david garcia but i think depending on him that guy is not pitching well and has been hurt a lot and wasn't that great when he was when he was better <laughs> so i would say they have clark schmidt and that's and and they're just sort of holding on to the side of their seat 
yelling we so so Mets fans are I also wait wait I also in the piece today I I, I detailed do do you realize how how much injury pass that they all their current starters have other than Cole yeah Tyone oh. has two Tommy Johns uh Herman was on the IL for shoulder injury this year Luis Severino is on the uh, on the IL for shoulder injury right now Frankie Montas was on the IL for shoulder injury earlier this season <laughs> mm-hmm. oh yes this is a team that doesn't need a guy who's proven to be healthy over the past few years I don't know that that, that one's weird but yeah I think with the Mets um they drew a line, and I think the one that I wouldn't have drawn, I think I would have traded Mark Vientos for Wilson Contreras. If that was on the board, and I bet it was, um, I would have done that trade because Vientos is striking out a lot in AAA. Um, you know, he plays third base. It's not necessarily a premium position. It's not like he's a, a young shortstop that you got to hold on to. And you got to trade somebody. Keep Beatty, keep Francisco Alvarez, fine. But like, you can trade, you know, one of your prospects it's for a big upgrade um, at the catcher position. But otherwise, I would say the Mets are just an amazing team. They're just like pretty well built. They have depth everywhere. Like, and they really their worst spot was DH, and they improved it with a, a what is it, a, a Vogel Ruff, Vogel Ruff, yeah, yeah, Ruff and Ruff and Bacher. They uh, they they have a Vogel Bach Darren Ruff combo back there that should be good, righty righty lefty and. Um, you know, that was their worst position before. So uh, they did do something. It's just uh, pretty small. The biggest critiques, I think, for the Mets were yeah, behind the plate, especially with James McCann hurt, but even with James McCann healthy, they could use an upgrade. That was the spot that they should have upgraded. If you want to say that they failed at the deadline because of that, I think you're just looking for uh, a reason to be extra harsh. I think it's disappointing, but at the same time, they did upgrade in terms of getting more power. They do have more depth. And that's one thing that the Mets have been doing going back to the offseason. They've built a deeper team than they've had in a long time. I think that bodes really well for their chances of, of mixing and matching down the stretch, having the right guys in the right spots in the postseason as well. So it's not sexy. It's not sexy to go, yeah, we got t- uh, Tyler Naquin, Darren Ruff, and Daniel Vogelbach. Guess what? Like they're they're better the way the way they are now. They they are improved and they had a top five offense as it was previously constructed. The flaw was they didn't hit enough home runs. Most of the guys they brought back, that's the thing they do first. They hit home runs. And I think that's the that's actually a good sort of way to go uh, if you're there. And I think the other question with the Mets was did they need one more pitcher because of Jacob deGrom just coming off the IL? You know, Carrasco's injury history, Taiwan Walker's got a few injuries as well. You can look at that know. group and say they need one more guy to get David them Peterson and, and Trevor Williams are not, you know, uh, my favorite starting pitchers, but you know, compared to uh just having Clark Schmidt, you know, <laughs> uh, and you have Megill, you know, on his way back. Uh, I think he's a big question mark, but that is uh, a a superior depth position than the Yankees. In the bullpen, uh, I think they could have maybe added someone in the bullpen to just lengthen it. The Michael Givens, yeah. you know, the Michael Givens one was weird for me because by stuff he was, he's, he's really lost a lot and he's already, he was already below average. Um, and so I, I think he's uh, what they're like fifth best reliever. Yeah. Cause Diaz, Lugo, Adovino and May, and May when he's healthy and May's coming guys, back. Yeah. Those guys are all better than Givens. So I, I don't know. I mean, maybe other than maybe it cost it would cost too much to get someone who is actually better than any of those three. I, I get it. Look, I I I am a a fan of a team that underwhelmed me at the deadline. <laughs> I can understand, but but I don't the Mets and the Yankees like they should be elephants stomping through the forest, right? Like they should just they should just do everything. You know, well, they should they should have a ridiculous bullpen. They should go out and put David Robertson in that bullpen just because they could. That's that's a good that's a good push here because I think what we don't know about the Mets is what's Billy Epler going to do at any given point? Is he going to be that kind of GM or is he going to try and be a thread the needle type? And this is more what a thread the needle GM would do. And I don't know if threading the needle works in New York. You can get away with it maybe in Milwaukee Stomp if you get the results. The forest and be a beast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
So uh, that's that's the probably the part that's frustrating. It's like, well, if this were any other team, this would be okay. But Preller didn't just get again. Soto; he got Bell and Hater, you know, <laughs> like, and Drury, and Drury. Like he just didn't care. He needed uh, all those upgrades, though. Yeah, they, he, did. they were they were a tier below the best of the best teams in the league. By even war, when Tatis was getting they're, healthy, they're fourth now. In a, yeah. in a virtual tie with the Braves uh, for fifth. So, and what were they before all their moves? Like fifteenth, seventh, or eighth? No. Oh, okay, but it's just a, it, it doesn't. You can't move the needle that much because it's two. It's two months and it's war. See, I thought they were lower in part because, well, I guess Tatis would have been factored into the projections all along, but uh, they they were a very average lineup without mm, Tatis, yeah. especially. Yeah, for sure. They, they they definitely added more war at the deadline than anybody else. So I've decided uh, with more time to let it sink in. Brandon Marsh for Logan Ohapi is my favorite swap of the deadline. Yeah. Easily my favorite trade because it was the one Inspired we just didn't see my coming. whole piece today for sure. <laughs> well, that's always appreciated. So like, what else? What else made the cut? I didn't get a chance to read your piece yet, so this is all going to be new to me. Oh, uh, Montgomery, uh, Montgomery, Montgomery, and and the Marsh trade were the most intriguing. Uh, there was five intriguing ones: the the Blue Jays uh, trade um, and the Siri trade uh, in yeah. Tampa. But but Marsh was uh, really and actually, what's interesting, there is a common thread here: Marsh, Bader, Siri. They're among the three. They're three of the five best center fielders by outs above average this year. So there were three teams that went and got elite defensive center fielders. I don't know if it's it's a trend. You know, every time, like, is it a trend or is it AJ Preller? You know, <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> I think it's it's a it, it's a reminder that there are a few spots where teams really still prioritize elite defense, and center field is one of them. And yeah. most contending teams already have a shortstop in place, so they're not usually trading for shortstops because that's not how it works. But you can actually trade for for great defensive center fielders. Yeah, that's true. And and the through line for all of them is is there enough bat? And in fact, of the three, I think Bader, you know, Bader, a guy who you know, in our tears project, they said the scouts said they weren't sure he had a carrying tool bat, like he that he had a bat, an everyday bat. Uh, he has the best bat of these three in terms of, at least in terms of projections. Um, I like, you know, I like Marsh and I like him more than Siri, uh, but I was surprised by how similar they are. They both strike out like 35% of the time. They both barrel around 9% of the time. They both have, you know, 111, 112 max exit velos. Um, you know, the one difference is Siri has a swing strike rate of around 18, which is high, 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 high. Uh, and Marsh has won more around 13. So, and, and has like a actual reasonable swing strike rate against fastballs. So, you know, there may be more to work with there. And, and also Marsh had lower stri- swing strike, uh, strikeout rates in the minors. So there may be more to work with there to a possibility of getting him to 28, 26% strikeout rate. If you do, uh, I could see a breakout for Marsh. Plus Marsh is in a nice stadium for his offense. Uh, I think this was a good deal for him. Ohop is also interesting because he's an offensive catcher right before automatic balls and strikes. Yeah, I know you've you've mentioned the timetable for that. It seems like you have a more aggressive timeline for that than it's on the way, that. man. It's, it's like coming. it's like in double A. If it's in double A, it's like treat it like a prospect. If it's in double A, it's coming, man. <laughs> it's like one or two years. So uh i i think i think i think the the over under is a year a year and a half <laughs> you know it's either two years or one year is my is my guess all right so well. but but you know i think it's also interesting that the angels you know there's this uh finding uh that matt swartz had that that teams know better about their own players than other teams in free agency i don't know if that's been proven in trades like this but it is interesting that the Angels got an everyday look at Brandon Marsh. They they developed him. They brought him up. Uh, they released Justin Upton this year because they said Brandon Marsh and Joe Adele are the future. Uh, and then they traded away Brandon Marsh. I think it's it's possible, and and this is something I talked about with with Al on the Fantasy Baseball podcast this morning. It, it's it, it's possible that something with Marsh is is true like that. Where they they see something they can't fix. So they say, well, we need a catcher for the future. It's kind of hard to find those. And Logan O'Hoppy's blocked. 
in Philly. Like JT mm-hmm. Real Muto is not going anywhere anytime soon. So they saw an opportunity to get better at an important position for them. They've got pretty good outfield depth. I was trying they really to really need a center fielder. Does it mean does it really mean anything as far as the long term health of Mike Trout? Like the the Angels' willingness to move a major league ready center fielder? Probably not, actually, just because it's sure. one important position for another. And I think it's easier to go out and find outfield help than it is to go out and find impact catchers. Well, I think Adele can probably play center. The 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 there's a wild card here, which is weird. Uh, Marsh was slated for center and Trout was like, nah, I, nah, I want to play, play center. center. Yeah. yeah, it was weird. And I think in, for my team, if we were about winning games, Trout's not in center field for me. No. No, he, he would not be. I, but I think, yeah. if he's the leader of the team and you're like, uh, if he wants to play center, he's going to play center again next year, then I guess you trade away the guy who is not a great left fielder in terms of offense and right. is is a better center fielder. <laughs> so it's a little bit of a, like team fits for both, I guess, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I'm, but I'm with you. I, I just think that was a pretty interesting deadline. I think the Angels, they, I mean, they could have panicked in the wake of the Trout news. They could have moved Otani too, and it was clear before the deadline that they decided they weren't really going to make that happen, at least now. Maybe it'll happen this winter, if, if it happens at all. I think a lot's going to hinge on just the overall health of some players coming back. But surprise they moved Rysel Iglesias in that multi-year deal, because if they thought their window was still as open as it was going into this season, getting rid of an impact reliever probably wasn't the thing that made the most sense. Yeah. But Counter argument how... to that though, T- Tucker Davidson comes right. back controllable pitching for them. It's, it's, it's important. starting starting pitching has been as hard for them as anything. Maybe they feel like they can just go out and spend 15 million a year again uh, on a new reliever. Uh, maybe go get Kenley Jansen. Kenley, Kenley Jansen, right? Yeah. Cause yeah. I, Iglesias goes to Atlanta. You can make a one year deal with Jansen. You don't have the multi-year closer anymore and you've got other good relievers. So that could be part of their plan. But uh, I did sell low on Mike Trout in one of my leagues. Uh, mm, it, you get? This might offend some people. I might get some yelling. I, I, I did have a friend tell me that I did poorly. Um, <laughs> uh, it's a keep six, and he's like a, a fourth rounder. So he's you know you keep him at their round. So he's yep. already he's was already my most expensive keeper. Um, my other keepers were like Jordan Alvarez in like the 10th, you know, Shohei Otani in like the 11th. So like, you know, I have some really great keepers. I won last year and I'm in the, in the, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Those of you on YouTube can see the where, which way Derek is already leaning. Uh, anyway, I'm making excuses. Um, but, uh, I traded him because I thought of him as my fifth best keeper out of six. I traded him for people that I'm not sure I'm going to keep, but would may help me win this year, which is Reese Hoskins at first base, uh, going into a timeshare or or pushing Rowdy Telez to the bench, and uh, Stephen Kwan in center, uh, who pushes Aaron Hicks off of my off of my team. Uh, so I think that I think, and this is a, a league with K's by batters. Um, and uh, I also got Noel V. Marte. We have four free minor league keepers every year. Okay, uh, so right. I got Noel B. Marte is the minor league keeper that's free. Uh, maybe Hoskins goes into a group with Bregman uh, and Glaber Torres as my final keeper. So I went from Trout as my final bat keeper to one of Hoskins, Bregman, or Glaber Torres. Um, and for that, uh, I got Stephen Kwan, who I was running Aaron Hicks out at center, and. I need to do better. So it's now a Hicks Profar center field platoon. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I guess maybe I didn't do enough. But here's, here's my thinking. Here's my thinking on Trout. We talked to a, bat, a, a back expert uh, in email uh, who, is, who is talking about this. I, I have uh, very little faith he's coming back this year. First of all, the Angels aren't good. Um, and there's no reason for him to come back. And secondly, um, this is a type of injury I gather from speaking with this uh, back expert that is fairly serious um, and you should give it all the chance to heal. Now, he seemed to suggest that if you give it all the chance to heal and to heal well, he might be fine going forward. However, what I see with Trout is this ongoing issue where if there are any injuries, he's just going to be done for the year if the Angels are bad. So 
I bet against the Angels as much as I did Trout because Trout could go back into next year and be like, I feel good. Everything's fine. He could play for three months, find some nagging injury. Angels are out of it. He's like, nah, peeps, I'll be back again next year. So <laughs> has that not described like the last two years? It's fair, totally fair. And you know, look at the games played count and go all the way back to 2017, 114, 140, 134. So not bad those two years, but some wear and tear starting to pile up. 53 out of 60 in the shortened season, 36 last year. And if he's done this year, 79, we don't have confirmation of that. It's just a, a see, It's a high risk that if the Angels are bad again and, uh, and he's got some sort of injury, he's just going to be out. Plus, can... he's the most expensive keeper I had, so... Yeah, well, okay. So it's not a bad trade. I'm not I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be as mean to you as your your friend was in this case. I, I think your theory about how they would handle him makes sense. The organizational track record over the better part of twenty years would lead you to believe that you're acting on the side of yeah, any any sort of nagging problem is gonna shut Trout down. And even if like, we're talking about two to three seasons into the future where he's still a player as talented as he is now. Very good impact player, keepable in a league like yours for sure during that window for the per game production. How difficult is it to replace him in your league? I think is a huge question and how valuable he is too. I think we're we're starting to push Trout into this, this sort of like stars and scrubs. Like if you're in a 10 team league and you only start three outfielders, it's really easy to replace a player when he's out. And then the per game production is still so good that he's a difference maker. In those cases, he fits really well. If you're talking about a 20-team dynasty league, that's a totally different calculus, the waiver wire replacement. And then, of course, where you are in, in a long-term league. Are you playing for now, which you are? Okay. That's an argument for, for buying Trout, I think, uh, and, I, and I'm comfortable with it because uh, you know, we're only a 12-team league, but uh, it's fairly deep. And, uh, for example, I was cobbling together my center field, and it was Aaron Hicks, Jock Peterson, and Jerickson Profar. So that's a pretty low level of production i was getting and uh uh so you know it's fair uh, and maybe i made the wrong move but i also uh, would rather be a year early than a year late on some of these declining older bats and i like noel Marte a lot especially coming up in cincinnati uh and then on top of it i had a chance to win this year and i don't think mike trout's coming back this year so uh, this part of it was you get a better keeper i'll have to figure out my last keeper uh, but I want to win this year. I'm in third place. If I can run somebody better than Aaron Hicks out in center field, maybe I can win this. Trout turns 31 on Sunday. What does someone get Mike Trout for a birthday gift at this point? <laughs> Buy in for his next fancy football league. <laughs> it sounds like he is kind of or, a owner. Or, or I take over commish for you. That's a, that's, that's that's a real great. good birthday. That, that, that's one of those <laughs> gifts. You know when you, sometimes you see like a charity auction and it's a, like gift value priceless like yeah. being the commissioner of that league i mean obviously uh he was in over his head in that case i was thinking maybe mike trout would like an astrolabe which uh there's an episode of the simpsons where homer buys an astrolabe What's so an astrolabe? It, it's um it's an ancient astronomical instrument that uh, was a handheld oh. model of the universe. So, it, it, oh yes, I think he might like something like that. That seems That's like cool. a thing Trout would would yeah. actually, you know, find some appreciation for. But I think the commission thing is the best thing. You got him the better gift than I did. I got him, <laughs> I got him a piece of junk that he'll look at once and throw in Put the corner. <laughs> yeah. So I'm sure we'll have a ton of Mike Trout talk between now and opening day next year because why wouldn't it's we? Gonna keep coming back up. Let's get to our prospect of the week segment. Kind of a fertile ground for prospect of the week with a lot of players prospect getting traded. Of the week. Do, 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 do. You <laughs> added the music to the vocals for yourself, too. It's making my job easier in every possible turn. Uh, since you're very excited for this segment, I think you should go first. Who is your selection? You probably have more than one. I don't think there'd be a rule against that. There really are no, no. rules on this show. No, no. There, there are very one. few rules, at least. I have one. Uh, I just wanted to bring this guy up because he he belongs in that San Diego Padres con a conversation we're having. Um, uh, there's a lot of excitement about Jackson Merrill, 19-year-old uh, shortstop and A-ball for the Padres and totally could be the next uh, C.J. Abrams that jumps up into you know the top 15 and the top 10 over the next couple of years, depending on how he uh, ages. I think the one thing we're watching is the power 
Um, but uh, and he does hit too many ground balls, uh, but he makes a lot of contact, has good patience, very athletic, uh, great tools, uh, and I think the defense to stay at shortstop. So, uh, you know, picking up a, an A ball guy is is better than picking up a low A or a complex guy. Uh, so at least he's moved his way out of that. Uh, obviously, it can go any any direction from here. Uh, because he's a 19 year old and a ball, but uh, just, just want to mention that because maybe, uh, maybe he's already found the next prospect he's going to trade away. <laughs> it's good, good chance, good way to look at it. Uh, I've, I've decided that because I very rarely say nice things about the Oakland A's, that I should talk about an A's prospect. And I was doing some leaderboard surfing over at Rotowire, they've got hard hit data on prospects and Jordan Diaz a third baseman in the A's organization actually stood out to me really young for the level. He's 21 years old. He's played all season at double a Midland. So that's a great place to be for a player that age. He's popped 14 homers to 307, 354, 506 line. Not a guy that I've heard a whole lot about. I don't dig into a lot of prospect pods outside of the fantasy episode I host with Al every week just preparing for that so probably a guy that could creep into some top 100s just looking at what he's doing in terms of the underlying numbers again age to level clear path to an opportunity and I saw that they took Zach Geloff who's missed some time this year with a shoulder injury and they were starting to play him at second base so it almost looks like they're trying to figure out how those two players might fit together on the same infield in the not so distant future so Jordan Diaz uh, a sneaky prospect to probably add. I don't mean the league you described where you get four minor leaguers. That's probably not a deep enough league because that would mean you have to be basically a top 50 sort of prospect to be on the radar in a league like that, but a watch list player for leagues like that. um, And then probably a a must add type in leagues where at least 10 prospects are rostered by each team. And and honestly, if you just, if you are keep keep four minor leaguers, you may just uh, eliminate pitchers from your keeper pool completely. In which case, you're just asking him to be a top 50 bat prospect, you know, mm-hmm. uh, top 60 type bat prospect. So, you know, he could be on, he's probably still on the outside looking in for that. But, uh, you know, one thing that I would monitor with him, I love his combination of, uh, you know, strikeout rate and isolated slugging. I just want that ground ball rate to just keep getting a little bit lower, you know, and, yeah. and so far, so good. But, uh, his fly ball rate is also the lowest it's been uh, in his career right now at this stop. So there's some, some, uh, something there. I want to see some growth in the in the ground ball fly ball mix, but otherwise, uh, good pull. Yeah, hard contact up a bit from where it was last year. Twenty seven point five percent. Sports Info Solutions provides that data on the RotoWire pages. Those are scored manually, um, so they give you a good approximation. But again, age to level has to be a consideration with Diaz, but also age for contact quality is something that I think is really important. Uh, hit locations look really good in terms of using the entire field. Doesn't, pull, yeah. maybe doesn't pull the ball enough. That could be, that could be something he does more in the future as could he be advances. a way to unlock some power. Yeah. Yeah. But I really like the, uh, the overall approach here. Nice low K rate, really productive season at double a, and just trying to give A's fans something to be excited about too. <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's bleak right now, but you know, Two, two to three years from now, maybe it'll start to get a little bit better. Let's get to a few emails here. Got one from Pete. Pete writes, I was ecstatic to get Ronald Acuna at the turn in my 10-man redraft league, and he quickly dashed any lingering injury concern by swiping bags at a higher rate than he has the past few years. But outside of an earlier power surge, his pop seems to have disappeared. He's had some bad luck on balls in play, so I'm being patient. But it's getting harder to watch him roll over on pitches night in and night out. Any real concern here? Love the show. P.S. Spent part of this summer with my kids in the mountains of Zacatecas, Mexico. And when I had signal, I would download the weekly episodes for our longer drives. After a couple of weeks, my kids and their cousins would fight to ride in my rental car because they wanted to listen to the baseball nerds. That might be a, a new name for the show. Yeah, yeah, it could just be rates and barrels, colon, the baseball nerds. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. No, Acuna um, is obviously struggling a little bit. I, I want to know if it has anything to do with the knee or it's just something mechanical. I mean, he's obviously hitting too many ground balls and pulling too many ground balls so that, you know, the rollover uh, critique is 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 there. 
at the same time, you know, the max EV says the raw power is still there and the barrel rate is the same as it was in 2019 where he hit 41 homers. Now that was, that's the rabbit ball. So you would have to change that number, but uh, I would just say that the raw power is there. Uh, he's, he's not reaching a, he's reaching more than they did last year, but he's, it's not a ton. Um, and, uh, I, I see he's like a tweak away, you know, like, I think he's, I think something's going to click for him. I think one thing that we can still the collective, we, not you and I specifically, the one thing that we can really overlook sometimes with a hitter coming off of a leg injury is the importance of your legs in hitting. In, mm-hmm. I, I just wouldn't, I, I wouldn't discount that right now. I, I'd look at this and say, Everything in the the barrel, uh, the barrel percentages looks comparable to what it was earlier in his career. You know, the hard hit rates being in line, the strikeout rate still being good, but the, the ground ball rate still old, looks good. Old grounders mean something's off. He's he's definitely something off there. He's 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 yeah, he's pulling off on those. But it seems fixable to me because of the the quality of the contact. Even though he's not hitting the ball in the air as often as we'd like. So if there is any any glimmer of being able to make a move for Acuna in a long-term league right now, absolutely do it. Uh, it it's it's disappointing to not have that power, but the, the steals are so valuable right now too that he's. I think he's been better than I expected, even though it's been in a, a different shape. Like the production this? has come a different way so far. What is his, uh, what's his earned value? Hmm. Where do you, well, while I look it up, what well, do you so think he picked it them, is? He picked him 10th or 11. So I'm guessing it's not 10th or 11th. I'm guessing it's not top 10, but I'm guessing it's still maybe top 20, in which case maybe he's not producing exactly as you wanted, but he's not tanking your team. So let's have a look. I'm looking at 15 team leagues using the Rotowire in season number. $14 is what it spits out for Acuna. So mm. that's not top 20. It's actually. 40 top 60 i think would oh, be where that is but right. hold on a minute though I, I i do think the 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 raw earned value numbers are a little bit unfair when we're comparing someone who missed 30 ish games compared to everybody above him so if you adjust it for time lost because you're thinking about acuna plus whoever you had to replace yeah, him, can you, you put a, a date, zero date filter on that <laughs> it'd be awesome if you could I, I think he's probably more like a low 20s player since coming back and that does kind of put him in the I don't know the the Trout, Harper, Seager, Abreu, Matt Olson. Those guys all do it different ways, but that that would be pretty good. That's closer to like a top twenty, top twenty five hitter. None of those guys on a per game basis. Picks, no, 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 Trout and Harper were. Well, it's a it's a major injury. I mean, it's again, it's great to see him running as much as he has because I thought that'd be the last thing to come back. And I'm starting to think that maybe stealing bases is not the hardest thing about coming off of a torn ACL. Yeah, I just be I guess. still hitting the ball might actually be the hardest thing about it. But thanks for the email, Pete, and uh, I'm glad that your kids and their cousins were enjoying the show, even if they were just making fun of us the whole time. At least it makes <laughs> those drives a little easier to get through. Uh, I got a question here from John. John's writing about an auto new points league in rebuild mode. Had a few stars this year, including Trey Turner, Jose Ramirez, Ronald Acuna, Jose Barrios. He was hoping to flip prospects, and that didn't exactly work out. So he had to settle, try to get better uh, by realizing that trading for hurt players is actually easier to get surplus value on the roster. So the question is, how do you evaluate injured players like Tyler Stevenson or, or Kyle Lewis? Putting prices aside, it seems like those are players that teams are just willing to move on from. Uh, when you're thinking about multi-year players like that, you know, like are there certain injuries that you're comfortable buying into, and certain injuries that you're not? I mean, is it certain positions, certain skills? Uh, when when do you feel like injury risk in a long-term league is worth seeking out? You know, the Kyle Lewis thing is interesting because this year it's been a concussion that that uh, laid him low after the knee thing, but I think it's the knee thing that's more worrisome because that's more of a chronic uh, situation that's going to be managed over his career and probably. Uh, puts a an earlier end date on his career and 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 means that he's you know there's gonna be load management involved and you know I I just see that as as you know being a bigger deal. The Stevenson thing is a major injury that may affect him next year, but I think at some point he'll be back to 100 percent and I doubt it's leads to chronic problems. 
I mean, it, it all has to do with what it looks like when you get in there. I think it, how displaced the fracture was and, uh, you know, how, how long the recovery is and stuff. Um, so, you know, stuff that a doctor could answer better. But I think just generally uh, nagging, especially like sort of bone on bone. Remember how Utley's career ended? Uh, he had bad knees and he was still good when he was in. Um, but uh, it was kind of a like a... You know, if I remember correctly, um, I'm actually going to look up all these numbers now that I said all that. But. Well, no, I I remember a pretty sharp decline there. I don't I don't think you're off base, but you can confirm uh, in just a moment. Yeah, I mean, for I last few four years, 400 plate appearances, 500, 350, 200. So, yeah, I really caught up to him in those later years. I I think with Kyle Lewis, that's that's the type of chronic injury risk that yeah, there's a discount there. In a long-term league, I'm really not that interested. I, I think he's better better served in short-term situations where people might be undervaluing Maybe him. Maybe you catch lightning in a bottle and you know he's actually healthy for the, for the last couple of months. Yeah, but I think in multi-year leagues, I don't think you're... I don't think you're looking at Kyle Lewis as a you know, $1, $3, $5 in pickup that you're going to hold for multiple years and say, yeah, he's been great. He's been a $15 or $20 guy year over year over year after dealing with knee stuff up to this point in his right. career. It's unfortunately but just Stevenson, one of those things that's going to hang around, I think. But Stevenson, if let's say next year it's not he's not 100% or whatever, or he doesn't have the whole offseason to train, he's not as strong. Um, let's say you get 80% out of Stevenson. Well, let's say he's like a $3 catcher or something, right? So that means, you know, uh, in 2025, he's a, five, he's a $7 catcher. He might still be worth that, mm-hmm. you know, and he'd still be worth keeping at, at that level. Um, and, uh, and he might be cheap enough where, uh, maybe next year you have to buy like a five or $6 catcher to pair with him just to make sure that you have two good catcher, like at least between, between one of them, you have a usable catcher, uh, but he'd still have value going forward. And if you might see by the end of next year, oh, the exit velocities are creeping up, the barrel rates creeping up, you know, here he's starting to get good again, you know, he's starting to, so I, I kind of like a, a catastrophic injury like that in the better in a way. Like I just, it's just a one injury. It's like a, uh, as opposed to sort of a collection of, of soft tissue, nagging knee problem type stuff. I, I don't like that. Yeah. That's kind of the key difference for me. You know, the, the devastating one-off injuries they're they're not easy to come back from, but I'm not as worried about it. Once the rehab is complete as I am about something that's bothered a player for Kyle Lewis with his knees, it feels like it's been, like plus we years both, now. yeah, we both think Acuna is going to be great next year, right? Like a first round talent, even. Yes, I, I would, I would agree. I think that's yeah. that's still where I expect him to go. And of course, he's got two months and change to to persuade everybody with uh, more production the further he gets away from that injury. But thanks a lot for that question, John. Uh, we got another email here. This is a trade question for Ben. It's a seven, uh, seven, keep seven league with a 260 salary cap, it's a 10 team rotisserie situation. And there's some salaries here, of course. So I'm going to run through this real quick. It's a simple trade. Give away Bobby Witt Jr. in a trade. He's at 15 as a keeper and get back Corbin Burns at 27. The other keepers include Devers at 44, Eloy at 27, who must be kept, Wander at 15, Jess Chisholm at 15, Joe Musgrove at 15 and Adley Rutschman at five. So not a lot of pitching on that team. Giving up the you know more interesting young player that can do everything, especially steel bases. If Devers is 44, though, as a keeper, and you could keep Burns at 27, like if Burns were back in the in the auction, he'd go for 40 plus, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe your best pitcher on the board might even go for 50. And what was Wit? But Wit's price was like 15? Wit was 15. So the, the you know the it'll it'll progress and he'll stay behind Burns for a while. I so love what Witt is doing, dude. His his chase rate has just gone down, down, down over the course of the season. I I think he's sitting settling in, and he's I think he's a really top top talent. I think he should be like a I I might push him to like second round next year. I have to have my whole board in front of me, but you know, like I I'm pretty excited about Bobby Witt. I I wouldn't do it. All right, so you like wit enough to not lock in the top end pitcher at a slight discount because the multi year discount. Yeah, like, because year over year over year, I think you're going to keep wit for three, four, five years, and Burns. You know, I don't know. Do they get more expensive over time? They do. Uh, I think we've got for 2024. Wit's only 20, and Burns becomes 38. That's a pretty big jump. So because wit it might moves be a one year deal for Kurt, for Burns, or maybe two. Could be so. I think with that, that's enough to keep it on the preferring the the wit side. And 
wow, being stuck with Eloy at 27 is not great, but uh, that's a, a conversation for a different day. But thanks a lot for that email, Ben. I got a question about Walker Bueller that came in from Matt. Matt wants to know if Walker Bueller's problems before he got hurt were just a one off thing or if they were signs of longer term issues trying to look to make some trades and keeper league where they can keep eight players. Don't know if I should move him or someone like Spencer Strider or George Kirby for hitting help. So if you had injured Bueller and people were interested versus Strider, who looks amazing, and, and Kirby, who we've talked about a lot on this show. Trade Bueller, trade Bueller. Are you trading Bueller? Yes, I would trade Bueller. There was a drop off in stuff on his four seam uh, that was pretty dramatic. He was still pretty good. And we saw Urias kind of have a drop off and stuff and kind of shrug it off and, and had a great year uh, and figure it out. But um, I just think the Bueller is more dependent on his velo than Urias. Hmm. Um, and uh, you can also look at it from a traditional standpoint, which is he's always outperformed his strikeout rate and his swing strike rate. You know, and usually team players don't do that over the long run. So I think there's two ways to look at Bueller that you sort of, you know, wonder if the production is going to continue even when he comes back from injury. Plus, he's injured. So, like, <laughs> they could turn into Tommy John. Like, it still could. Yeah, so yeah. I would trade Bueller in this situation. Like, I'm definitely not trading Strider. That That's like a rocket ship taking out from the moon. What was the other one? Kirby. I like Kirby, too. Uh, he's very different than the other two. More of a, a command guy. But he's got a bunch of pitches. The, the stuff is improving a little bit over time. And the slider command is elite. So I'm going to take Kirby, too. All right. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm on board with that. I mean, I just think the the dip for Bueller probably brings him down to, I don't know, top 10, top 15 starting pitcher ceiling. Whereas yeah, pre decline with that stuff, he had that top five sort of cap that we'd seen in a few seasons. So it, it's a lower ceiling with added risk. And if you can move that for a bat that you'd love to keep, I mean, you're probably not getting first, second round bats back in the return, but some of those third, fourth round caliber you may bats. You not even get that for good. Kirby. I mean, Strider might. The one argument for mm-hmm. trading trade Strider is Strider might get you whenever you want. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Strider but, but might But even then, the other team that. might say, how many innings am I going to get the rest of the season? It may Fair. have to be with like a rebuilder. Yeah. Well, this might be all about long term value. But yeah. But yeah, you're trading Bueller to a rebuilder. Uh, I guess if the return, if the, if the other team says, I give you whatever you want for Strider and I'll just give you this list for Bueller, then maybe compare the lists. But my instinct is to say trade Bueller. But more importantly, the broader answer to the question here is that you saw enough of a decline in Bueller before this injury to alter expectations for him. Even if he comes back healthy and this ends up being an injury that, doesn't impact him all that much in the future but i think there is a chance this is the kind of thing that comes back as something more serious certainly encouraging to see him working his way back so far of course the end of the day tuesday we got very sad news in the baseball world vin scully passed away at the age of 94 you know and i think as many people have said it he's the voice of baseball like he he did that his career was just incredible and i think my favorite thing if I'd watch Dodgers games was to just hear Vin spin the yarn and, and tell stories that you never expected. And I was wondering if you had a favorite Vin Scully call or story or moment from several years of just enjoying the games he was calling, because I had the, the story that sticks in my head is the one he told about Madison Bumgarner and his wife coming across a snake and Bumgarner, not knowing if it was a rattlesnake or not, decided that he had to, to take out the snake with an axe. So he cuts up the snake to kill it. And they find a, a they find rabbits inside, baby rabbits. And they nurse them back to health, which is just an absolutely absurd story. Yeah. And just Vin casually telling it as he's calling the game the way he really only he did. Just weaving things in and out. Like you'd, you didn't miss a second of the game and you were glued to the story. And that's such an amazing gift to have as a storyteller. I think that was the the in-game story that resonated with me the most. And, um, you know, just a guy that we've missed ever since his last game in 2016. No, I, I remember that one. That, that might be my pick as well. But I think uh, one of the things that really uh, impressed me about him was you've seen so many 
players or so many players and broadcasters with their his sort of longevity in the media uh, kind of turn on modern baseball and um, end up sort of decrying and maybe they have legitimate gripes, but uh, maybe spending too much time uh, sort of outlining and, and detailing and chronicling each of those problems with modern baseball where I never, I never really got that from Vin where I just, I got sort of a lifelong love of the sport um, and a continued positivity uh, to the very end. You've seen, that that clip of his last uh, sort of salutation and the the Irish poem and um, Irish benediction and I, he just it was unfailingly positive, you know. Um, and that is such a hard note uh, to 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 continue to ring, you know. As a writer, um, cynicism creeps in because you're you're in the you're in those press boxes for bad games and you have bad interactions with players and you can spot maybe something in the game that you don't like and you can start to sort of pick at it like a like a like a like a scab Uh, but um he just sort of i I don't think that he wouldn't acknowledge those things he might acknowledge it and say you know things were different at a different time but um he didn't put that value judgment on it that uh a lot of older uh, players and broadcasters have. Yeah, I, I just think that that constant joy around the game. I imagine that for most people doing any job for as long as Vin called games, like you'd you could you'd find it dull and boring at a certain point, no matter what that job was. You never got that sense. It could be a, a meaningless game at the end of a season with the Dodgers going nowhere, and you'd still enjoy listening to the stories that Vin would tell on the broadcast. And I don't think we'll ever have another person quite like him in the sport. I mean, working, working solo and doing, doing the, uh, the pre and post stuff that he did for so long too, just truly an amazing talent and just someone that really changed the game in a way that influenced thousands of people that, that get to talk about it and write about it today. So definitely someone that will be missed. And I've really just enjoyed reading a lot of the tributes and, and hearing a lot of new stories, uh, but things that were before my time, especially. And I really, really uh, just enjoyed that coverage, even though it's very sad that Vin Scully is gone at the age of 94. We are going to go. If you'd like to ask a question for a future episode, you can send those our way. Rates and barrels at theathletic.com is the email address. You can drop those questions on this video on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't done so already. You can find Eno on Twitter at Eno Saris. You can find me at Derek Van Riper. That's going to do it for this episode of Rates and Barrels. We are back with you on Monday. Thanks for listening.